Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We will be getting started in one minute. Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The speaker and planning committee members have disclosed no conflicts of interest. To receive contact hours for this CPD session, participants are required to attend the webcast and complete the evaluation form, which will be emailed to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. You'll see on your GoToWebinar control panel that you can send a message through the questions feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to post to the presenter. Be sure to hit send so the message makes it to us. To practice using this feature, please submit the state or country you are from. On behalf of Sigma, we would like to thank our speaker for sharing her expertise with us today. Our speaker is Dr. Holly Way. Dr. Way is an associate professor at East Carolina University College of Nursing. She is a national and international speaker on leadership development and clinician well-being. She's talked on TV and radio shows to promote nurses' health and published over 40 peer review articles since 2016, including five nursing practice models. Dr. Way is a North Carolina Nurses Association Board of Directors and editorial board member of Advancing in Nursing Science, an international journal for human caring. Now let's go ahead and turn our presentation over to Dr. Wei. Hello. Thank you, Emily, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to, to meet you today. And I appreciate that Sigma International organized this event for us to have this opportunity to discuss this important topic. Uh, I do not have the, um, any um, conflict of interest to declare. So for the time being, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my video camera and then I'll, until the question and answer time. So today's objectives, after the presentation, you will be able to understand the concepts of post-traumatic growth and the resilience. Describe the science behind the self-care, the pathways to build a resilient brain, and apply the self-care strategies to plant seeds to develop and grow during and post the pandemic. The world has been experiencing an unprecedented time since last year because of the, the COVID-19. It threatens the global society, leading to collective emotions and shifting, and shifting the, the, cult, the society's culture and actions. And we are still in the middle of the pandemic and challenges. Living during the pandemic can cause people to experience mental distress, such as stress, anxiety, fear, panic, depressed mode, hopelessness, grief, and social isolation. Some may develop post-traumatic stress disorder, we call PTSD, having difficulty recovering after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. Others may not be able to get rid of the undesirable thoughts or worries, have a difficulty sleeping, avoid work, commitment, emotions, and engaging as unhealthy coping, like using alcohol or substances, or experience frequent physical symptoms. Healthcare workers are experiencing trauma. As COVID-19 cases increase, so does healthcare workers a traumatic experience and a mental health distress. During the pandemic, frontline healthcare workers faced warlike circumstances, including psychological trauma related to prolonged suffering, more deaths than usual in a short time, and in many cases, uncertainty 
and a lack of ac adequate resources to respond. They are also afraid. The fear of contracting the virus, infecting others, including their children and other family members, and even death. The pandemic has lasted for a year now, and there isn't a clear end in the sight yet. The acute and chronic pandemic-related stress has exacerbated healthcare workers, especially nurses and physicians, pre-existing high levels of occupational-related psychological issues, such as high levels of job-related stress, burnout, depression, and suicide, which some researchers and professional organizations referred to as a burnout epidemic. The burnout epidemic is detrimental to healthcare workers' health and patient care quality. American Nurses Association, more specifically, American Nurses Foundation, conducted a COVID-19 pulse survey in 2020 about nurses' mental health and wellness. More than 10,000 nurses participated in the survey and shared the impact of the pandemic on their mental health and wellness. Over half of the nurses indicated they have felt overwhelmed and close to 50% reported feeling anxious and irritable. About 40% of the nurses felt sad, one third of them felt angry, isolated, lonely, and depressed. Only a little over one third said they were confident in their ability to handle things or felt their work had meaning. Only one third of the nurses did that. Barely a quarter of them reported being resilient or optimistic about the future. Some nurses felt numb, guilty, betrayed, or like a failure. These are not good feelings to have. These feelings may even further drain our already depleted energy. I would say that it may like when we use our cell phones in an area with the weak signals, our phones try to room to find the signals, which can drain our battery faster. When these negative feelings room in our minds, they can accelerate the drain of our human body energy, affecting our physical and emotional stamina. When nurses were asked whether they experienced an increase in any of the following symptoms in the last 14 days, 60% of the nurses reported they had a difficulty sleeping or sleeping too much. About 40% said they were overeating. One fifth of the nurses said they had a difficulty maintaining relationships and used alcohol. Some of the symptoms, as you can see, indicate depressed mode. One thing I want to see that this survey was done between March 20 to July 6, 2020, which is almost a year ago. That's the beginning of the pandemic. So how are nurses feeling now? As of now, more than 100 million people have been affected and more than 2.2 2 million people died due to COVID-19. So we have all been directly or indirectly affected by the pandemic. Our life has changed. We've just talked about traumatic experience and the psychological impacts of the pandemic. You've probably heard about you know, PTSD, a stress response to an abnormal event. And today, we'll talk about the concept of post-traumatic growth, the transformation in the aftermath of trauma. The concept of post-traumatic growth isn't new. It comes from Asian traditions. There are dis discussions of how we should respond to suffering in life from the philosophical, religion, cultural, and traditional perspectives. Researchers like Dr. Tedeschi and Cajon give this concept a scientific name called post-traumatic growth in the 1990s based on their research. Post-traumatic growth may also be called stress-related growth, adversarial growth, and positive psycho psychological changes. 
during the research, they found that in a in addition to the distress because of the tra traumatic events, people often find that they learn something of value, which I have also found in my own research with the parents of children with congenital heart disease undergoing heart surgery and front line nurses caring for patients with COVID-19. All traumas are devastating. It is not the trauma events that create the positive change, but what people do in the aftermath of the events. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, philosopher, and also a Holocaust survivor. He founded the Logotherapy, which is a school of psychotherapy using meaning searching as a fundamental human motivating force. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he wrote, everything can be taken from a human, but one thing, that is the human's freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. As human beings, most of the times, we cannot control what had happened or what may happen. But what we can do is to choose how to respond to the events and our attitude toward them in the aftermath. Why post-traumatic growth can be different for each person? Dr. Tedeschi and Cajon identified five general ways that people described their changes after trauma. These changes include feelings of personal strength, developing deeper social relationships, recognizing new possibilities, having stronger sense of meaning, purpose, and spirituality, and a greater appreciation of life. After the trauma, people described a sense that they had never they are stronger than they ever thought before. Many people reported re experiencing improvements in their relationships, such as being more empathetic, more compassionate, and understanding. They are more willing to reach out for help, express emotions, and learn to trust others during difficult times. Trauma may interrupt the goals set out to accomplish in life. When re-establishing priorities and identifying new goals, people can see new opportunities they might not have thought possible before. And trauma is often accompanied by the efforts to make sense of what had happened and why things happened. The process of adjusting the worldviews may lead to greater clarity about life's meaning and purpose. Trauma often threatens what people value the most in their lives. The recovery process may lead to a greater sense of gratitude for the things that they might not have noticed before taken for granted. Like what we see, to stop and smell the roses. So I conducted research on parents' experience of having a child with congenital heart disease undergoing heart surgery, and found similar descriptions. Parents described an emotional roller coaster, from shocking to blessing. During the process, as their child underwent heart surgery, they experienced the shock, ups, downs, twists, and turns of emotions. But in the end, Parents described it was a blessing for their family. They said when they left the hospital with their child, they valued the blue sky and the fresh air even more than before. They described hopes, opportunities, and appreciation of life. We see parents' emotional ups and downs and also see their positive changes. For the study about frontline nurses who worked in, in the epicenter at the initial times of the pandemic, the most uncertain times, 
We also saw the growth and a positive transformations after they completed the mission and left the epicenter. The psychological changes of the frontline nurses included three stages, early, middle, and later phases. They changed from feeling ambivalent to em emotional exhaustion, and in the end, felt energy renewal. So we just talked about the concept of post-traumatic growth. Before going into self-care strategies, I would like to go over some brain anatomy. I want to point out the thinking and meaning making center, the neural cortex and the limbic system. Neural cortex, the front lobe of the, the brain is our thinking brain. It helps us construct meaning, make decisions, and regulate emotions. The limbic system is part of the brain involved in our behavioral and emotional responses and higher mental functions, such as learning and the formation of memories. The primary structures within the limbic system include the amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and a singul cingulate gyrus. Amygdala is the emotional center of the brain. Its primary role is to trigger the fear response, the stress response system, and regular emotions. Thalamus is the central hub that sorts data, like the wireless router we have at home. It serves as a, a relay station for the almost all information that comes and goes into the cortex. It plays a significant role in cessation, attention, alertness, and memory. Hypothalamus is the master control of the autonomic system. It controls behaviors such as hunger, thirst, sleep, sexual response, and regulates body temperature, blood pressure, emotions, hormone secretions, it maintains our homeostasis. Hippocampus is a memory center, storing new raw information from the senses and the emotion-related data sent by the amygdala. It manages our memory. Basal ganglia is responsible for organizing motor behaviors, coordinating rule-based and habit learning. So it's very important, you know, when we need a new habit. And cingulate gyrus is an important part of the limbic system. It helps regulate emotions and pain. It is thought to directly drive the body's conscious response to unpleasant experiences and help orient the body away from negative stimuli. So how do our brains process the information or data sensed from the environment? There are two processing types for our brain to sense and respond. They are sensation processing or the bottom up and express way of thinking. And a perception processing or a top down and a thoughtful route of thinking. They work together to analyze information and send response signals. So the first one is the sensation processing. The brain receives data from the environment through our senses including touch, taste, sight, sound, smell. And these signals first go to the emotional center, the amygdala. If the amygdala senses danger, it immediately activates the fear circuit, the fight or flight response, without waiting for the new context commands. This process is known the bottom-up, the processing, which is also an express way of thinking. For example, when I work in the yard and I see a snake, the amygdala is suddenly alerted by my sight sense and start the fight or flight response. I scream and jump away. I do this subconsciously. So the next processing type is the perception processing. The perception processing is a thoughtful route. Senses were related to the, the neurocortex and the cortex interprets the sensations, makes sense of them, and sends response signals. If the fear is not real, then the fear alert is relieved. 
But if it is real danger, the brain will activate the stress response system involving the HPA system. This is a longer route, a thoughtful route, and also a top-down processing. And go back to the example. I'm still working in the yard. Later, when I see a green water hose, the amygdala first reaction was a ding, ding, danger again. The expressway makes me jump and run away. However, when the data are related to the neural cortex, which sees no danger, the alert is released. Fear is a good, useful response and essential for survival, but anxiety is not. Anxiety is a fear and that cannot be located in space and time. Constant high levels of stress and anxiety can continually ramp up our HPA system, which can be debilitating to our body functions. So we just talk about HPA system. And what is HPA system? This system refers to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The HPA axis is a neural hormone feedback system between the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands of the central nervous system and the adrenal glands situated above the kidneys. The negative and the positive feedback system regulates the physiological mechanisms of stress reactions, immunity, and fertility. Now let's take a look at how the, at the HP feedback system. So perceived stress can trigger the hypothalamus to increase the production and release of the corticotropin, corticotropin releasing hormone, the CRH, and arginine vasopressin AVP. So when detecting the CRH and the AVP, the pituitary gland is stimulated to produce and secrete the adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH. That then stimulates the adrenal glands to make and release cortisol hormones into the blood. Cortisol, as we all know, plays an important role in helping respond to stress, fight infection, regular blood sugar, maintain blood pressure, and regulate metabolism. However, if it's too much or too little, it affects our, stress, our health. When certain levels of uh, corticosteroids are detected in the blood, the brain will signal the hypothalamus to stop producing as much CRH and arginine vasopressin, and, then, and also the pituitary gland to produce less ACTH to, con to control the cortisol level. This is a negative feedback through an inhibitory pathway. Well, this is where we can dialogue with our body and our brain through self-care strategies to help the feedback loop and control cortisol level and the stress. So now let's take a look at how we can communicate with our body and mind. There are two pathways through which we can communicate with our brains cognitive pathways and behavioral pathways. We can modify our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors through cognitive training, emotional regulation, fear and anxiety management, social connections, and physical well-being. New Age author and spiritualist Don McGill Ruse wrote, the human mind is like a fertile ground where seeds are continually being planted. The seeds are opinions, ideas, and concepts. You plant a seed, a thought, and it grows. Every human mind is fertile, for the seeds is prepared for. So how can we plant the seeds that can grow positivity? So based on the pathways to build resilience, and the research evidence from neuroscience and positive psychology, I developed the energy self-care model. So this model provides six categories of strategies for self-care. These categories include connecting with an energy source, nurturing kindness, practicing emotional hygiene, refocusing purpose, germinating positivity, 
appreciating your uniqueness. Energy source. Energy source are sources from which energy can be obtained to sustain life or function. We all need to connect to an energy source to help us survive physically and recharge emotionally. So there are two sources of energy, physical and emotional. And here is a, a graph with an X and Y axis. The x-axis indicates the level of our physical energy, and the y-axis shows the emotional energy levels. If you are low on both, your energy level will be on the left lower quadrant. I place the graph on the negative zone because if we are energy depleted and have a negative attitude, we not only affect our own energy level, but also drain others' energy as well. If we high on both, you will be on the right upper quadrant. You can be like a life buoy, filled with air to lift yourself as well as others as needed. That's what healthcare providers need to do. The public depends on us. It is up to us whether how we how much air we can fill up in our life buoy so that we can carry them up to the surface. So it's essential to find the right energy sources to help us charge and recharge. So physically, we have the basic needs to be met to sustain our lives, including adequate sleep, balanced nutrition, moderate exercise. These are essential and fundamental needs for physical health. Another energy source comes from uh, human connections which include our social support system, family friends support, natural spiritual beliefs, which is vital to nourish our minds. For the science behind the energy sources, I would like to mention three main functions, the HPA axis, central oxytocin pathways, and endorphin. And let's see sleep. Adequate sleep and regular sleep patterns the circadian rhythm can affect the cortisol awakening response. Sometimes you heard the CAR, C-E-R. It indicates the circadian cortisol rhythm, an increase of cortisol within the first hour after awakening. This response is an important indication of HPA axis function and related to stress, affective disorders, and a physical health risk. So our sleep quality can affect our hormones and energy level. Social support helps us with a sense of belonging and companionship, which is critical for resilience building. Research shows that people with a strong social support and relationships have a lower risk of psychological issues than those who lack that support. When we have a close relationship with others, we can have a surge of oxytocin, a feeling good and love hormone that motivate us to seek trust, belonging, bonding, and healthy relationships. Exercise can promote our body to develop a hormone called endorphin. Endorphins are neurotransmitters. They interact with the receptors in the, in the brain cells to block pain and control emotion. When endorphins are released during exercise, we experience an endorphin rush, or we heard the runner's high, boosting our energy and regulate, regulate our emotion. So the next one is nurturing kindness. We have all experienced others' kindness and performed kindness to others. When we help others, our central oxytocin pathways can be activated and give us a surge of oxytocin, the love and feeling good hormone. Research shows that oxytocin can release stress, reduce cardiovascular stress, and improve, improve the immune system. We can raise our oxytocin through interpersonal touch, such as handshake and hug, caring, compassion, respect, empathy, and random acts of kindness. Practicing kindness toward others and having feelings of gratitude can give our brains with a surge of oxytocin and serotonin. 
often referred to as a helper's high that helps regulate mood and emotions. Well, this is a picture I took when, when one time I went for a run in a um, hike the trail and I saw this dog, you know, the front dog has two legs and then the dog at the, at the end, she could not walk or he cannot walk and also blind. So this picture really touched me and I asked permission that the, the owner said, can I take a picture? And she said, yeah. So just by looking at this picture, it gave me a surge of oxytocin and serotonin. And think about these two dogs. If they don't help each other, probably none of them can walk. But because of they help one another, by helping one another, both dogs get a chance to walk and enjoy the nature. And that's what the, the, the kindness helps. I think, you know, help one another and help building a social um, compassionate community. The next one is the emotional hygiene. We have all learned how to take care of ourselves physically. We learned very early on how to brush our teeth to prevent cavities, put bandages when we get injured. You know, we always got taught drink water and take vitamins, we were, you know, to prevent being sick. However, we are rarely taught how to care for our emotions and put bandages when, feel, when we feel rejected. We can learn how to protect ourselves through cognitive training and emotional regulation, placing bandages to our minds. The triangle displayed here is a cognitive triangle depicting the relationships between our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Dr. Aaron Beck is an American psychiatrist who is regarded as the father of a cognitive behavior therapy, treating a variety of mental disorders, including anxiety and uh, depression. One of the key components of the therapy is the cognitive triangle, showing the interrelationship relationships of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And now let's take a look at how emotional regulation works. Emotional regulation is the ability to control one's emotional state. It involves down regulation and up regulation. Down regulation is reducing the intensity of emotions. For example, an anxious person may cope by distracting from the thought causing the anxiety. He talk, we talked, you know, talked about the express way of, um, of thinking and the thoughtful rod of thinking earlier. Emotional regulation is to rot the information to the neural cortex for meaning making before acting. One important way to downregulate our emotion is deep breathing. When we are stressed and or anxious, our breathing tends to be shallow, fast, irregular. You know, that's, so for example, you know, used to be in the cave age, if a lion chasing you, so what we do is we just like to really breathe. There's no time to, for deep breathing. So it's like, that means we are really stressed out. So deep breathing can activate the body's natural relaxation responses and stop an acute stress response in its making increase oxygen supplies to the brain, stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, and promote a state of calmness. So there are a couple of ways to take a deep breath. You know, one of them is called box breathing. What is that, what does that mean? The box breathing is like it's a square. You know, inhale, inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and hold for four. So, you know, the breathing, just try to regulate, regulate your breathing pattern. Another way is the four, seven, eight. Inhale for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. So another way to, for the uh, emotion uh, regulation is to exchange positions. Harper Lee, an American novelist, wrote in her 1960 classic book, To Kill a Mockingbird, that you never really know a man until you understand things from his point of view. Climb into his skin and walk around in it. 
exchange positions may help us understand others from their perspectives and help us regular, regulate our emotions. And focus on reasons to feel calm, finding a purpose for doing so. I would see promoting health would be a good, great reason to control um, our emotions. Expressive writing and disclose difficult feelings. James Pennebaker, an American psych psychologist, wrote a book, Expressive Writing, Words That Heal, and developed an idea that expressive writing can help disclose feelings, help to deal with trauma, and improve health. He recommends writing 15 to 20 minutes a day for consecutive days, but some therapists suggested even if you can write three to five minutes a day, consecutively, reflecting on your deep thoughts and feelings, that might help too. So when you write, you organize your new ways of uh, thinking, new, create new narratives, which might have been interrupted by trauma or an emotional uh, event. You can make new meanings and a purpose of what happened, which can help you dig you dig up your deepest feelings and the let the neural cortex reassess it and give its meaning. So another thing, I just finished a study with other nurse leaders on nurses' post-traumatic growth, resilience, and emotional health during the COVID-19 pandemic. What we found is that allowing nurses to express their feelings, negative or positive, was significantly correlated with the nurses' post-traumatic growth. So now, upregulation. Upregulation is increasing one's emotions, which can be useful when an imminent danger or challenge calls for unhealthy, for a healthy dose of anxiety and excitement. We can wrap up emotions by serving others and developing an inner power. Gary. Zukov, one of the pioneer members of the New Age movement in psychology, wrote in his book, The Seed of the Soul, there are two kinds of power, external power and the inner power. The external power can be given and taken away from you, but the inner power belongs only to you. No one else can take it away without your permission. So refocusing, neuroscience and psychology suggest that we can rewire our brains and change our thought trajectory. As we mentioned earlier, our mind is like a fertile ground, constantly being planted. We decide what to plant in ourselves. While we cannot control some events from happening, what we can do is to change how we interpret them by reappraising the situations and shifting our focus. So I would like to invite you to do a little practice here. And there's a blue dots on your screen. And I would like to invite you to really focus on the blue dots and look at the shape, look at its color, the shade of the color, to really take in. Now I would like to invite you to close your eyes and think about the blue you just see. And also think about the red you just see. Now you can open your eyes. It may be easier for you to, to still remember, to still see the blue, but not as easy to, to see the red. Because all that you had just focused was on the blue and did not even pay attention to anything red. With the current situation, it's very easy to focus on the negative stimulations and the situations. So what we can do is to, to you know, reduce our anxiety and the fear by limiting news consumption, letting go of some perfectionism, being compassionate with ourselves, finding meaning in what we do, and finding our new op opportunities that we might not even think about before. Again, what we plant, what we reap, 
when focusing on the negative, we see negativity. If we plant positive optimism, then we can be in the track of becoming positive and optimistic. So the next strategy category is germinating positivity. So I developed and actually, uh, you know, cultivated uh, you, like a, a strategy I called, uh, called ABCDE, including appreciating life, beginning our day with gratitude, cultivating a growth mindset, developing positive habits, and encouraging to use positive and optimistic language. So we can focus on what we have, planting a seed of appreciation. Set a positive intention of the day, intentionally planting our mind with a gracious, kind, respectful, and meaningful seed. Things you can do to include like listening to positive and elevating messages, reading inspiring books, uh, surrounding ourselves with the people who are uplifting, inspiring, and encouraging, and somebody who may challenge you to be the better of you. And you can increase your gratitude by performing random acts of kindness, paying kindness forward, practicing gratitude um, daily, you know, by writing positive journeys, like journals, like positive stories you see during the day, and journals, uh, what happened during the day, and we have heard about three good things. You know, you can write about three good things what during the day, or what you did, actually what you did at the end of the day. So by cultivating that, we may also, we may plant some positivity seeds in our mind. And using positive language, words are powerful seeds. We become what we speak. We are our own predictors. So instead of seeing the words like imply, permanent, or pervasive, like I always, I never do something right, I can't, or like everything's wrong with me, you may think about using words indicate temporary, like this time, next time, and not yet. You know, I didn't do it correctly this time, not I never do anything right. Oh, I have not done that yet. You know, something like that. So that having a growth mindset. And these habits and activities can fuel ourselves with the positive positivity, facilitating the positive seeds to grow inside of us. When we focus on good and positive things surrounding us, our brain's neural pathways create a happy hormones like oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. These hormones make us feel loved, belonging, significant, and accomplished. As some nurse managers I spoke with, you know, earlier, I was doing my research, and they started sh shifted their um, unit routines. I remember sometimes we give a report during the day, during the morning, we say, well, like, oh my goodness, we had three coded last night, we had a horrible night, and three people called out. So what do we do? We started doing all this negative, but some of the managers shifted and they started their shifted reports with good things. You know, what we ha what happened last night, all the good things. We, those were set the tone of the day. So the next one, the last one, it'll be yourself. We are all miracles to come to this world. Appreciate life and who you are. There's not another person just like you. You can start to value yourselves through knowing your strengths, acknowledging limitations. We are all humans. We cannot do everything you know, we want to do. There are limitations. We want to save everyone. We want to save the world. But sometimes we have to see, okay, there are limit limitations what we can do. Building your inner power. We just talk about that. And, you know, nowadays, the, the, the work environment, we heard about the workplace bullying and incivility. How can we build our inner power? You know, for, for nurses and for everyone, teenagers, 
setting realistic goals, goals that we can reach if we put efforts, which motivate us to take actions towards our goals, desires, and needs. So every time we reach our goals, we feel good. That good feeling can give a surge of uh, serotonin and dopamine, so making us feel accomplished, rewarded, respected, and important. So we just talk about oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, and these strategies can help us do that. And then the moderate exercise can give us the um, endorphin. So in conclusion, we just went through some self-care strategies and the science behind them. Traumas are never desired, but should that happen? Should they happen? What do we do and how we handle them in the aftermath make a difference? The year 2020 and so far have been an unprecedented time for all of us. What do we do during and after the pandemic will make a difference in our past, in our, you know, our, during now and a post-traumatic growth. So it takes all of us, take all of our efforts to rebuild, including organizations, teams, and individuals. Organizations can do their share by providing resources, structure, and support required to facilitate post-traumatic growth. Teams are the immediate environments for nurses and individuals. Team leadership is vital in creating a healthy and healing environment. And the culture to promote employee relationships and a sense of belonging. For that, I have several articles. One of them is work, a nurse's work environment, uh, which is a top cited article in 2020 uh, in Palm and Central. And another one is from a Journal of Nursing Management is how the nurses uh, role in fostering nurses uh, resilience. That also is a top down, download in 2019-2020. So individuals can adapt good habits for physical health build a positive and growth mindset, develop a purpose and meaning, find energy sources, and embrace new opportunities surrounding us. So we can all do this. I wish all of you good health physically and emotionally, and the very best in the year and years ahead. I really like this John kabat word, we cannot stop the waves, but it can learn how to surf. And this is me, and I really appreciate you take your time to join the seminar, and thank you for attending. Please feel free to ask your questions now. We do have a question. Is there a comparison data on pre-COVID-19 mental health and wellness survey items? They just would like to know what the baseline was. The other one, I have to see the um, the Nurses Association. They might have, uh, American Nurses Association, they might have some data in between. Um, and But we do know, um, actually it was on my slides, I didn't talk about it, uh, deleted after that. Um, there's one article, um, from California, uh, researchers from California, they used the 2005 to 2016 uh, centers for disease, no, the centers for disease, disease um, data set, a longitudinal data set. What they found is that um, nurses' suicide rate actually is higher than the uh, general public. That also really indicates the psychological issues uh, nurses have before even the COVID-19. Um, so I think a nurse, American Nurses Association just conducted another survey. It will be interesting to, to compare what now a year later and from what happened the last survey um, between March and July last year. 
Is your new study on nurse resilience and the pandemic published yet? And if so, what journal is it in? Um, the, the, the two I showed here, are, they are already published. One in the British, um, you know, we have the American Critical Care Association. The one that we published, the mental distress is, was published in the British Critical Care Nurses Association's uh, journal. Um, and uh, the, the, the second one, the, the psychological change process was published in the issues in mental health nursing. So the one we just submitted about post-traumatic uh, growth and um, resilience and uh, healthy emotions, we submitted is under review right now in a journal. Um. You had mentioned exchange positions. Can you please elaborate on what this means? Exchange positions are basically just see something happened. That person says something or did something. What is the meaning to that person? So I try to understand what the other person said and instead of wrap up our own emotions to really to really step into the other person's perspective, what I did make that person think about that way. So try to exchange this position to see from to see from the other person's perspective. That way, actually, the beneficiary will be both of us. You know, it will be um, kind of be good for my. I I don't for me my emotions. I don't have to be wrapped up so high. Maybe that's just that person. You know, I remember. There's a story, um, a taxi driver. So one person rode on in the taxi, the driver was driving. And suddenly a, a person just like, you know, th threw in from another lane. And then the taxi driver had to really st stop hard. And then the, the person inside the car said, why didn't you honk or why didn't you do something? And he said, well, you know, some people, they are just like a garbage truck, they just, they have the garbage, they have to dump somewhere. So basically what we see is that, you know, somebody else did something, it's not, it may not be because of you. They just have, they, that's their lifestyle. You know, they have some issues to solve and emotions to, to solve. And I heard, you know, we remember the anger management, but we cannot punish ourselves because somebody else did something. So that's what exchange. Also, maybe somebody really, didn't get the training or something stressed out and using the anger, just like we see the survey being anger, irritable. And there might be something because they are stressed out in the workplace, they might be stressed out. Another per perspective, the exchange of position to see how can we help? How can we help you? How can I help you to really get rid of this issue? Like children, you know, if they are angry, then maybe there's a, a their way to show I am stressed out. I don't know what to do. And that's also the leadership maybe can step in to see how can we help you. So especially during this state, this situation, really for nurses, we all work together. And if somebody's really being stressed out, angry, irritable, maybe we can see whether we can step in. Being kind, nurturing kindness, that's not just for you know, for us, we can help one another. Like I said, the dog, you know, if we can help one another, we can all survive during this situation. Self-care practices require some level of time commitment, either physically or mentally, taking time to work through these strategies and apply them to our lives. Many of us lead busy lives and are consumed by obligations and feelings that we don't have available time. Do you have suggestions for how to reconcile the time requirement with the sense that we don't have time to care for ourselves? Two things. Why is the return on investment? Why I see that? For example, there's the curtains dirty. I ask you to see, okay, can you dust the, the curtain? You will say, I don't have time for that. But if I see, well, if you dust the curtain, I'll give you $1,000. You say, okay, I do it right now. It's all about you see the value. You feel that you see you doing this has a value and you will do it right away. So if it's self-care and if you know you see the value, you will have time to do it. Like the curtain, I was I don't have time for that. I don't have time. But if I see put a value into it, you have time. Another time is the time. I don't have time for self-care. The things that the time 
number one is to put the value into it. Another way is like, if you put something in the microwave and you, instead of standing there for a minute, maybe you can do something. You can, you know, you can do up and downs. You can just do something. That's time, that's, that's activity. It's always time. You have to really work your schedule into it. Um, and the habits, you know, you do something, maybe after you brush your teeth, maybe you can do five push up or something. And always find time to do that. And again, always go back to the return investment to see what, what, what's the value for that. If I see the value, I will find time for it. So that's my suggestion. Do you have more resources or suggestions for teamwork in the midst of this COVID stress? Well, the teamwork, it doesn't matter if it's COVID-19 or not COVID-19. It's always a topic worth imploring exploring. So as you know, I mentioned yesterday, I just gave a talk about leadership theories. I just talked about about 20 to 30 leadership theories to really see the, what's the motivation and find the basic needs, the, the motivating factor in the workplace. So for leaders who really need to know each person, each individual, I was just talking to, to Eric about, you know, the uh, Herzberg two-factor theory. And there are two factors. One is the satisfaction, the motivating factor. The other one is the hygiene factor. What that means is that, for example, you go buy a car. Okay, I want to buy the car, look at the color, the gas mileage, and how it runs, the, the, the symptom, uh, all these things I look for. And I, I was so excited about the car. And then on the way home, I tried to open the window. The window does not work. I tried to open the AC. The AC does not work. And I tried to open the radio. That does not work. But those are the hygiene factors. They will not determine my motivation to buy the, were not the determinant for me to buy the car. But if those things are not working, they will annoy me. The same thing, you know, when we look for a job, we look for things we are looking for. But when we get there, the, the policy, uh, the work environment, so that might be something, will not determine the initial motivation for me to seek for that job, but it will annoy me. So nurse leaders need to know each person's motivating forces and what's the hygiene factors, and then work together to solve that issue. And to really um, to work together, they have to trust one another, they have to love one another. I always see, you know, when we to raise our children, we never feel like our children are our burdens, you know, unless they are teenagers maybe. You know, when we they are little, we try to feed them, to change diaper, to do all this. We do this because we love them. So a workplace, the same thing. We have to feel we belong. We have to feel we, we are cherished. That's why we want to do more. So that's the environment that the nurse leader can create together with the nurses, to create an environment to see we are here to support one another. When, we, when people feel the needs, like the Maslow's hierarchy, when they feel the, the basic need, they feel love, they feel, then they, they want to, 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 to do better, to feel self-actualized, to reach higher level of accomplishment, and then can work together when they have that cohesiveness. What information do you have on spirituality and self-care? Well, spirituality is different for each person. You know, some people to see, okay, I read the Bible, but others see, okay, this blue sky, the, you know, the nature will be something that nourish me. It's all depend on the person. Um, you know, like the families, the parents I interviewed, they are not all um, believe, have a belief. You know, these people, they do read Bibles and they have prayers, but others, they may not have a strong belief system, but they do have a belief value system to cherish. So each person, the old, the, down deep in our in our heart, we have something we believe, and we, we trust a higher power. It doesn't mean you have to be one or the other. Whatever you feel that works for you, that's your belief system, and you can seek uh, energy from there. We have time for one more question. Nurses are mobilized more and more across organizations and across states. How do we provide cross institutional? network of support. Can you repeat the question again, Erica? Sure. Um, nurses are mobilized more and more across organizations and across states. How do we provide cross-institutional network of support? 
Oh, so we are nurses. We are, our purpose is for for our health and co-workers and patients. Patients are our own, the ultimate goal. So for that, like the seminars you are doing, this is a wonderful way to do it. It's not like, oh, I do this for my organization. I do this for my organization. I do this for my own organ or institution. When we have something good, share the love. And then that way we can all grow together. We can all develop together and we can all serve our, the public together. So that's what I want to suggest, not isolated. United is the power. And thank you very much. Thank you so much to our presenter for all of this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with this audience and look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available on the Sigma repository. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.